Hello and welcome to this episode of The Defenders on Sunset TV. And in this episode, we are going to look at a subject which is always in the news. The line of control, India's military deployment there and the challenges that it offers to our forces when the Pakistanis decide to ratchet up tensions. The line of control has been in the being from the times of our independence. Earlier it was called the ceasefire line and now the line of control after the 1971 war, the 50th anniversary of which is being celebrated in December 1971. And in 1972, it became the line of control. Basically the same line, but much more intensive deployment now and the Indian Army continues to adopt a number of proactive strategies to ensure that it can limit, if not completely stop, Pakistan-supported infiltration of jihadi groups and terrorists who have continued to question India's role in Jammu and Kashmir and the fact that Jammu and Kashmir is very much a part of the territories of India since the late 1980s and more so from 1990 when Pakistan stepped up its proxy war. In this episode, over the next half hour, we will discuss what is being done there, what strategies have paid off and what challenges still remain. In this episode where we look at the line of control that divides the front lines between troops of India and Pakistan and some regard it as amongst the world's most heavily fortified military front lines. We have two former military commanders who have commanded troops and been there actually on the hot spot on the line of control. We have Lieutenant General Rakesh Sarma with us, retired as the Adjutant General but had the good fortune, I would say, as in military terms, to command 10 Div, which is in Akhnur, and from roughly where the line of control starts and moves upward right up to the departure point where the actual ground position line starts for Siachen, and that is NJ9842. And we have Major General Ashwini Sivach, who has both been Chief of Staff on 14 Corps, which some would argue is the world's largest military formation and also has commanded the Machal Brigade on the LOC. So both know the challenges that our troops face. I will ask you, General Sharma, uh, with your vast experience in the army, there are certain constants. And one of them is that the LOC remains a challenging front line. Can you give us a bit about the history, how the LOC came into being, where the ceasefire line was and what is the difference on the deployment on the LOC? Are they just minor modifications? And has the environment and the climate dramatically changed in recent years when there was talk of a ceasefire but the ceasefire didn't last expectedly? Your views. Okay. Uh, thank you, Maru, for calling us. Uh, factors that you've asked for 75 years of history in two minutes. Yes. Yeah. Now, uh, you recollect that 47, 48, when the so-called tribal invasion took place and the, uh, the tribals came in the area of Jammu and Kashmir, the erstwhile boundaries of uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, the J Jammu and Kashmir boundaries. And uh, as the ceasefire was brokered by the United Nations in April 48, uh, thereafter, there was a, a, you know, a commission made to decide the ceasefire line. This commission was, uh, we had great people in commission and, you know, uh, General Kirepa, General Manik Shaw, they were all part of that commission. And General uh, Srinagesh. And General Srinagesh was heading it. And there was a Pakistani, there was a, in fact a British general on the British side, a major general, I forget his name. So they both decided over a period of six months in uh, discussions as to where the boundary discussion took place in Karachi. I know. And you know when the uh, ceasefire line came up at that time. So a ceasefire line was drawn ridge to ridge, place to place as to where the forces were held. And it was brokered by the United Nations. There were United Nations representatives yes. present there. And the ceasefire line was decided at that time and, and it, it uh, uh, remained in this form for quite some time. Then we had the 65 war. Now 65 war, you know, when, after 65 war and you know the Tashkent happened, 
and the ceasefire line, there were minor variations. You know, some places were exchanged. You know, like for example, we captured Hajipir Pass, which is in 19 division and uh, of 19 division, and you know, subsequently we handed over. So there was some exchange of areas took place. 13620 was a uh, feature in uh, on Shingo River. Uh, you know, so that happened and you know, there was chum also. So, some minor changes happened after 65 war. Then came 71. You know, post 71, uh, there was a, uh, you know, when the, uh, after this uh, 71 war ceasefire took place and that um, the issue came up to Shimla agreement. And Shimla agreement, we went, went into Shimla agreement. Thereafter, General P.S. Bhagat and General Hamid of both sides, they were both in IMA together. I know. So, they knew each other. I well, so they both sat together, Indian side in Suchetgarh and the Pakistani side discussions took place in Wagga border. So, over a period of six months, you know, so they created, uh, I think, 27 maps, which were converted into 19 mosaics. And, you know, 19 mosaics had large number of overlays and appendices, where each ridge was went, gone into, starting from Sangam. Sangam is a place which is west of Janab River. Uh, uh, in the Akhnur sector, from there right up to NJ 9842, uh, which is uh, the beginning of Siachen Glacier. So, that entire 770 kilometer of area was marked peak to peak, ridge to ridge, valley to valley, river to river, and this was converted into, so there is no ad hocism about it. And these maps were duly signed, they are stamped, and they are available to everybody in, in, in that form. Okay. So, so, very well put, sir. Yeah. And in fact, uh, two points that emerge from it. The fact that it was so well defined and articulated made General Musharraf's position with the Kargil intrusions untenable because these were agreed, signed and identified locations. Unlike on the McMahon line, which is currently yeah. the point of attention of the Chinese, it is based on a line that eventually Henry McMahon drew in frustration when the conference in Shimla was not coming to a, an end that he had thought it should have. But back to you, Jan Saab. I want to understand from you that from 72 onwards, after the Suchetkar agreement, the line of control defined, agreed on, but remains a very tense area from either the areas of the crossings that Pakistan has adopted, particularly post-1990, and also the level of firing that continues there, uh, which can be extremely dangerous for the uninitiated. If you try and go there and have a look what is happening in the daytime, there's a good chance you'll get knocked off. So why is it that these ceasefires that have come into being and been announced have not led to anything at the end of the day? Is it because Pakistan does the ceasefire to please the world, but then goes back to its modus operandi of heavy firing on the LOC to give cover to the militants to infiltrate, and to what extent heavy firing aids their infiltration per se. Yeah, very correct. Uh, Maruf, see uh, the issue today which you brought out rightly. You know, e even in line of control, we have to also touch upon two issues which left. One is uh, that working border. It is that uh, basically uh, the LOC of Jammu and Kashmir, what we are talking about, the erstwhile Maharaja Hari Singh, uh, Jammu and Kashmir, and the boundary which is there between India and Pakistan. There is a certain portion which is there, which is called working boundary, and we call it international border. This I'm is aware, between I'm Punjab, aware, sir, but uh, we, are, we are not discussing yeah. that to that extent because the firing really begins on the LOC. Very correct. And so, so now, as far as the LOC is concerned, the firing is concerned, now what happened is the Pakistan basic aim is to send maximum terrorists in India. Now, as far as uh, concern, after what we have made an LC fence, that has become very difficult for Pakistan to send because this LC is quite robust with number of other issues which are there. It is technical, it has also electronic, it has also got lights and it is three tier. So having said so, it was becoming very difficult as far as the Pakistan is concerned to infiltrate. Mm. The only way to help this infiltrator mm. was resort to heavy firing. And firing in a such a manner that, you know, that uh, Indian troops get embroiled in uh, retaliating. And in that, during that period, the uh, terrorists can make use and they try to infiltrate from a, from a area which is not the same, maybe on to the side of that. So, this was the basic aim of, uh, of the Pakistan. Now, point is that when this firing takes place between India and Pakistan, 
you know the volume of fire which is given and the response given by indian forces mm. was too high no the pakistani never realized that because mm. the uh, quantum of uh, force level which we utilize like for example we have utilized bofors and a bofors have made a impact which was a catastrophic impact on pakistan and they start having hurt and they start feeling it that they cannot respond to us in the same way two thing one is economically they are not strong enough second thing their weapon system was not uh, as matching the buffer than all and at times when they have agreed on cease fire this is a tactical pause with the two reason one is they are now realizing it there is a pressure coming on pakistani uh, civilians when the casualties are occurring from our side also because they are firing and on collateral damage indian force never fire on a civil area but military area in pakistan has made very close to civil area so therefore there is a pressure as far as the civilians are concerned to have cease fire second thing is very important is when they feel it now there is a time to ask for a cease fire so that they can repair their defenses because we have created so much damage to their defenses so it's a tactical uh, you know uh, ploy which is been adopted by pakistan but never ever they have given up this idea of sending terrorists in india they keep oh. on doing it all your points all your points very valid in fact i'm aware also when the earthquakes came they used that lull to yeah. also fortified their front line position very good and the second thing is that uh, i'm told a lot of their positions are sited within villages and encampments so if you tend to target them there is the possibility of collateral damage, damage. and then they can show it to the un observers that operate freely on the pakistan side across the loc whereas we have limited their movement or control their movement post the shimla accord mm -hmm. and they show it to the un and through them get messages out to the world that india is the one that is disrupting the peace but jal sharma sir reference the new fencing idea that came into being because a jain saab referred to the fencing i am aware that idea took root really from 2003 onwards yeah. and then the fencing was implemented with lot of constraints yeah. because sometime the fencing had to be made a few kilometers behind the actual loc because the pakistanis won't let the engineers and the construction workers put the fences up so you have to go behind a hill feature and then make a fencing so that at some stage you could block pakistan infiltration but this new fencing which was considered at one stage as a model for about 10 lakh per kilometer that hybrid fence was to be spent and then it was tried in the 19 div area yeah. around baramulla where it was considered that about 10 crore would be spent on 2.4 kilometers but then abandoned because it was too expensive so two questions one is the two or three tire fencing how would it have been further improved with this new expensive fencing the second is if the first set of fencing hasn't worked how will the second set of fencing work because there are always nalas and rivulets from which these guys can send in the infiltrators your views yeah. thank you uh, first uh, maruf i'll take a step back that there is one cont uh, contention about loc which is important which is called holders keepers many people have written yes. about holders keepers anybody who occupies any part of territory it become, becomes his so that holders keepers kept us on the tenter hook right at the edge of the line of control and thereafter of course in 19 uh, when uh, 99 happened kargil happened these things were put to rest that even if the, uh, the pakistan had come and occupied some bridges for us <coughs> there was no holders keepers we used our might to recapture it so that's one part of the story second is that after kargil happened the thought process started about the fence the fence initially when it came up uh, 550 kilometers of fence you know it 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 doesn't go in the same form as the line of control but it goes on ridge to ridge as you rightly mentioned now initial deployment of the fence later on come came out that it was not so very viable at places because it was you know in places where you could not patrol it we not control it we you know you have dominated just a fence means no difference till the time you are there to make sure nobody crosses it otherwise anybody will cut the fence off and come yes. so the fence was recited mm. and then the mistakes came up fence in the area of say um, in baramula and kopwara sector mm. and the punch sector actually goes under the snow and it gets destroyed every season i'm told because I'm it's told. it's in a very bad you know uh, terrain the the snow condition and so you have to actually willy-nilly erect the fence every year in the month of april as the snows melt 
and to erect it in the month of April, you have to redump the stores previous season, anticipating ki agle saal, you know, they will be, this fence will go off. So you dump the stores in one season in advance. So, you know, the fence has done human service, but it has also tasked us to be vigilant and be ready for next year when the fence will go away. That makes a difference. Israel, as you're aware, has got a number of fences on. So the, we learnt as to what can be the modern fence and what kind of electronics can be brought to bear into the modern fence. That electronics now to say, you know, you put a radar there, then there were animals moving there, so the radars get activated by animals. So there we have require piece by piece, section by section of fence, which was tailored for that area. You just couldn't put a template across there. So the changes that are coming up are coming up live. It is it's there, it's every day. Okay, this fence, we need to shift from this line and bring it here or bring it forward. This fence, you require acoustics. This fence, you require a seismic devices. I mean, so each portion of the fence, instead of a modular, uh, uh, it became modular structure. So that changes, you know, such things don't happen overnight. You learn and you do it. So I think uh, a number of places, especially in south of Peace Punjal, the fence is fairly well guarded. But north of Peer Panjal, there is work on. Yeah, actually, very well put, sir. In fact, uh, there is a need to understand, and this is a question that is often asked, that if we have fences, then how are these guys infiltrating? But as you said, one is the fence is a work in progress. Two, it doesn't offer one size fit all solutions. And three, most importantly, it has enhanced the duties of the soldier on the ground. That first he was just guarding his trench. But now he's also got to guard the fence, which if cut through or broken, becomes uh, a kind of a false sense of defense you have. That you have a fence, to koi aega nahi, but the chap's coming through because you have not patrolled it adequately, etc. But General Sivach, I want to understand from you, and since you commanded the Machal Brigade, which is some way, Pakistanis call the gateway to India. So why is it that, as General Sharma brought out, that ahead of Peer Panjal, the situation changes dramatically and there are areas where these people uh, infiltrate with greater uh, flexibility, I would say. Say, for instance, in Boniar near Baramula, Machal of Kapwara <laughs> and Gurez of Bandipura. These areas are all areas which are kind of sought after by Pakistani infiltrators. So, two quick questions. One is, since they know they've been using that for decades and we are well prepared for their infiltrations, why don't they adopt other routes? And the second question is that how is it that after all these years, we have not been able to fortify this further in times while they were enhancing their LOC fortifications, why were we not enhancing more with resources and infrastructure to guard these areas. Absolutely. Maroof uh, very rightly said, you see, uh, I, since I commanded a Machal Brigade, and it is a brigade which you are saying gateway of India, where maximum uh, you know, infiltration attempts are made in Machal sector. The reasons are obvious. One is the terrain is very difficult. So the chances of uh, you know, terrorists trying to come through that is higher. And second thing is, it is a shortest route to Kupwada and Lola. So therefore, two issues are there, degree of difficulty, and once they cross the line of control, the LC fence, then they feel it, within one night, they will be able to come to Kupada and Lolab, where once they come there, then it is very difficult to then target them. So these are the two issues which main, uh, you know, why they attract them. But remember, as far as the, this area, Gurej, as far as Machal is concerned, Karen is concerned, and then going to Tangdhar. What is happening is that the line of control is moving, but the LC fence is not bang on line of control. It is basically uh, covering those dominating heights because after the uh, LC fence has come, your defenses have become tripwire because you are guarding the now the LC fence. 
and then you realize it you are guarding the lc fan and you are thinking that you will stop the infiltration but it's not possible because it is not humanly possible because the terrain is so difficult the weather conditions are this thing so we evolved an idea of multi tier uh, then deployment Ji. it is not only on the lc fans Ji. then after the first tier second tier third tier if the terrorists manage to cross the lc fans then we should able to take them in second third fourth tier then the point came what about uh, uh, the area between the lc fans and the line of control that also is about 1 2 3 km that is the area which was utilized by this terrorist and they made their bases and from there they were attempting it so uh, you know the whole system is very challenging now as far as the winters come there majority of uh, the lc fans come under the snow and 70% is get, get damage so if you have the state of art uh, you know lc fans and you spend too much money then as it is 70% is going to be damaged so you have to understand it the money spent and what uh, you know uh, advantage you are getting i feel this system as on today is not totally depending on the lc fans also have multi tier uh, deployment can keep the area under uh, you know observation by your technical also by sending your patrols so area domination is very important between lc fans and also between a uh, loc and also that in second third uh, defenses also has to be equally strong now the point which you told maruf that ki majority of the time the pakistan was concentrating on their defenses and they were preparing them well whereas the india was not the reason is simple because we were embroiled uh, our deployment is for ensuring that the infiltration does not take place our deployment is not on a conventional basis whereas the pakistani deployment they know it the indians are not going to send uh, the terrorists so their deployment is on loc on their defensive and hence they are getting more opportunity to keep on refining and keep on making their defenses more impregnable right. but okay. that has changed but uh, that has changed because when india realized this and when we realized that the pakistani posts are helping the terrorists and we were having a fire assault where you know the total number of all weapons on to the side is uh, brought in one uh, post and I you mean, reduce the um, this thing they also start responding according uh, so I've, we have I've done got, that i got that jal sharma last question to you short answer uh, as a division commander you would have known that the use of different types of weapons get authorized at the division or the core level at different times and artillery is brought in as a game changer but not too often can you explain yeah so you know uh, one learns you know see like i just take one step back <clears throat> in 2001 there were 2400 attempts to infiltrate in this year in the parliamentary uh, you know one of the questions uh, the minister has replied back there were only 40 attempts so the transformation is dram dramatic from those days now uh the border is also the sanctity has to be maintained from terrorists is also against any assault bad teams as you all aware of. so there is a uh, delegation of responsibility on which weapons to be opened by whom and that delegation has come up by experience of 30 years so if a battalion commander he can call for artillery fire if there is requirement for him to call artillery fire and he, he if there is a need for heavier support or medium guns and you go up on the chain you go to division commander or you go to co commander which are all in line so this system has been evolved to a i mean i wouldn't say every system is perfect but it's come to near perfection that's the difference between line of actual control where all this is not permitted yes, against china yes, yes. but the line of control it has been very fine tuned to area by area as to who is responsible to open fire depending on what is the threat at that point Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Very well put. Yeah, uh, we are completely yeah. out of just, time. Just we are completely out of time. Thanks very much. I mean, we can discuss this endlessly because the LOC has several dimensions more, which is difficult to bring together in a short TV program. But I think we have managed to educate the viewer quite considerably. Thanks for your wisdom and thank you for watching. Until our next episode, goodbye.